Welcome everybody to yet another episode of Cross Border Talks focused on Ukraine. We would have been both very happy to de to declare that the war is over and the refugees can safely go back home, but unfortunately this is not the case. There is a Russian offensive going on in Donbas, heavy fighting in southern Ukraine, and in the last few days we had also very um we had also rumors about possible violence around Transnistria, the separatist region that uh, the separatist republic on the western borders of Ukraine, not far from Odessa. We are going to discuss regional implications of the war of Ukraine, the possible consequences of what this war will bring to the entire region with somebody who has a very valuable insight into both Ukrainian and Russian way of thinking, somebody who served in diplomacy in Ukraine, somebody who had the absolutely unique expertise. So welcome everybody to Cross Border Talks. My name is Małgorzata Kulbaczewska figat I am accompanied today with my Czech colleague Veronika Sushova Salminen, who is going to present our very special guest. Hello, everybody, and I am very glad that I can welcome in our next episode uh, Professor Petr Drulak. Um, as was already said, he has really special expertise, in my opinion, because he is himself professor of uh, political science. He specializes for international affairs. He is professor at the West Bohemian University in Plzeň, Czech Republic. But he also serves, uh, served several years as a deputy of Foreign Affairs Minister of the Czech Republic. And he served at the time of the beginning of all this story about Ukraine, at the time of Ukrainian crisis in 2014. So from this point of view, he was by some things which of course he will not tell us he cannot tell us details but he has this uh, specific insight and he's combining basically or he's able in this case to combine a practice as well as theory which is important and besides of it he was also serving then as a diplomat as our ambassador uh, in france and i can say only one interesting fact about his engagement in France. He was the person who was able to make true in a way that uh, the uh, Milan Kundera, who is the most, uh, most uh, I think, interesting living Czech uh, literate or, or author, uh, was able to get back his Czech citizenship, which he lost in the uh, 70s during the communist time. So this is Petr Drulak, and we will today focus really on the regional implication of the war in Ukraine. Uh, that means we will have a look what does it mean for the region of Central and East Europe. Of course, Petr Drulak will represent a more Central European Czech view on the things, but I think it's also valuable. And because we live in the time, uh, I, I feel when the consequences are seen as reasons for the conflicts these days. They are exchanged. Nobody wants to speak about the real reasons, and everybody speaks about consequences which are presented as the reasons. So I would like to, in the first question, ask uh, Petr Drulak um, how we got here. Uh, what are the, the, the roots of the Ukrainian crisis and now the war in Ukraine, in your opinion? Well, thank you very much for this invitation. Thank you, Malgozata. Thank you, Veronica. I'm honored. And thank you for the kind inter introduction which you just made, Veronica. Uh, the question which you, which you just asked is a question which would require uh, one hour, two hours, perhaps three hours um, of, of, of le lecture. So I try just to say a few ideas and words about where we are now, because Right now, we are in the middle of disaster. This war, this war is a disaster. It's a disaster for Ukraine. It's a disaster for Central and Eastern Europe. And no doubt, it's a disaster for Russia as well. So I would say it's a general, general disaster. So it's right to ask the question, what are the roots of this, of, of this disaster? And uh, I do not have any master theory. I cannot say that there is just one... Um, that there would be just one cause which would explain everything. Because, I mean, what we often hear now in media, um, what, is so, what I would say is the official version is 
that it is all due to Russia or Russia craziness or Mr. Putin's craziness. And uh, that's it. And we are now close to the point when actually the people who contest this interpretation uh, are threatened. Uh, until now, they are threatened just by being accused of being pro-Putin. They are still not tried in, in, in the courts, but some of them are, are actually close to it already. So the freedom of speech uh, has been suffering recently. So um, I don't say that this cause does not ex exist. Uh, it's undoubtedly true that uh, Mr. Putin's behavior is reckless. It's very brutal. It's hazardous. And I don't think that he's uh, really serving um, uh, well his country's interest. But having said that, we need also to, uh, to look at the other side, because in international relations, we, also, we always have other sides. And in this conflict, we have at least three sides, not just two sides, but three sides. We have Russia, we have Ukraine, and we have something which we, we would call, or we can call the West, which means United States and Europe, basically. And uh, well, if we look, um, if we look at, at Russia, then we see uh, it's the story of the past 30 years, actually. It's the story we have to take into account the Russian transformation in the 1990s, the collapse of the Soviet empire. After the collapse of the Soviet empire, Russia started a transformation towards uh, what many hoped would be a Western liberal democracy. This, this has never been the case, even under the, under the Yeltsin years. So what we had, uh, what we have, what we have, what, what we saw at that time was not a Western liberal democracy. It was a special kind of oligarchy. Mr. Putin actually changed the system. He made it more autocratic. He actually tamed the oligarchs. He subordinated the oligarchs to to political uh, to to his power to to his power. But from the perspective, but what, what the West saw as an authoritarian turn, and it was an authoritarian, authoritarian, authoritarian turn, uh, many Russians, I would say ordinary Russians, saw it as a return of certain order, return of certain stability. The fact that, uh, that the wages were paid, that uh, the retired people uh, could uh, receive the, uh, the, 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 their support, Etc. Etc. That the public health, public schools actually worked be better than in, in the chaos of 1990s. So what was actually part of the uh, Putin agenda, what was, and what was more difficult for the West, was the fact that he also had this idea of restoring the Russian power, because in the 1990s Russia felt humiliated by certain moves uh, by the West, the NATO, the NATO enlargement. That was something which even Yeltsin opposed. But that was something which uh, Russia could still swallow. What was difficult to swallow for Russia was the bombardment of Yugoslavia at the end of the 1990s, because Yugoslavia or Serbia was uh, was was, uh, was uh, Russia's ally, and where um, where was uh, and where was where was the red line? That was the enlargement of NATO with Ukraine or Georgia. That's in 2008. At that point, NATO just announced that it would be possible. The NATO itself was not unanimous about it, and that's another story. But for Russia, that was a red line. No, you, it's not possible to have uh, Ukraine in, uh, in NATO, and they repeated this. That, that's something which, or to which they would react strongly. So uh, the Western policies in this respect um, actually still considered Russia as a collapsed empire, as a weak country of the 1990s, which can say many things, but which can be safely ignored. And what, what was the problem in the, that after 2008, the United States and European great powers actually continued with this policy? The fact that Russia said that Ukraine is important to, strategically to its interest, that it cannot actually have a hostile, um, hostile military basis at the Ukrainian territory. That was something which Russia kept repeating and the West thought that it could safely ignore it. Now uh, let's look at the Ukraine itself. I mean, the Ukraine transformation was is another sad story because that's uh, that's a story of so many missed opportunities. That was a country which uh, which had a huge potential at the start of the 1990s. I mean, if you compare the um, standards of living and the economic uh, uh, the economic level of Ukraine in 1990, and you compare it with Poland, Poland was doing better, but. 
the difference was not that big, actually. Today, uh, we actually compare countries which are from two different worlds. When we compare Poland and Ukraine, we cannot actually compare them. But at the in the 1990s, their level of so socio-economic development was actually quite comparable, even though even at that time Poland was was doing was doing better. But whereas Poland in the next 30, in the following 30 years was able actually to um, to really undertake very ambitious modernization, the path to democracy, market economy, etc., etc., etc. Ukraine, Ukraine, Ukraine transformation led to the oligarchy, to the to the to the rule of strong economic um, economic players who grabbed the assets which used to belong to the Ukrainian or Soviet Ukrainian state, and they basically ruled over the country. They took control over the country. That was one thing which is important. So the transformation actually did not deliver. The second question is that uh, Ukraine has always been culturally divided between the uh, Russian-speaking East and the Ukrainian-speaking um, Ukrainian speaking West and the center. And um, that, but th th that, that sh didn't have to be a major issue because all the Ukrainians wanted to have prosperity. They wanted to have decent government. No matter whether they lived in, uh, whether they lived in Luhansk, Donetsk or Kiev or Lviv, they could agree on it. And all of them could agree on a European perspective that they could have Ukraine as a European country. At the end of the, at the, end of the first decade of the century, after 2008, and the, the crucial was the development between 2008 and 2014, this European perspective became very difficult because it started to, because the West made it clear to the Ukrainians that, the, that their European perspective is not really compatible with close ties with Russia. Because even though it may seem strange today, in the, uh, at the start of the century, it was considered normal to have good ties, strong ties, intensive ties with Russia, and to have European perspective at the same time. Because even Russia was, uh, uh, had a European perspective to be like a, they wanted to, even Putin wanted to be, uh, wanted to have a European great power, to be Russia to, uh, as a European great power. So it was not a big wonder that Ukrainians thought that they could have both actually. However, that started, uh, that was, um, that was beginning to be, uh, that, uh, that started to be difficult once the NATO became involved, because for Russia, the NATO was, as I say, no go for Ukraine. And it was an option which was divisive because the West Ukrainians were able actually to give up uh, on the ties with Russia if they got NATO. The East Ukrainians were actually did not have, uh, did, not, did, not feel, did not feel that strongly about it. The decisive, uh, one of the decisive po points was the association agreement with the European Union. Because and that was, uh, the, the, that, that was before 2014, in the years before 2014, European Commission actually offered to the Ukrainian uh, to Ukraine an ambitious sort of association package, um, uh, including customs union. But that customs union was not comp compatible with its close economic ties with Russia. They would have to give up on these ties. And Brussels at some point made it clear to Ukrainians, you have to, you have to choose, they told them, you have to choose between Brussels and Moscow. And that was a big mistake because that was an impossible choice for Ukrainians. Well, because once they uh, once they were forced to make this choice, I mean, the people in the West tended to say, well, yeah, so let's forget about Moscow. People in the East actually would say, well, if it's like this, then we would probably have to stay with Moscow, even even though we, we don't like it. We would like to have this European dimension as, as well. So that was actually the dilemma of uh, the, that was the dilemma of the Yanukovych and that was the thing be, uh, which destroyed his presidency because at one point he said to Brussels yes we want to have it we want to have this association association agreement then he talked with Putin and he explained him that this is not possible so he gave up he, he gave up on it and then Maidan came this Maidan um, Maidan demonstrations people in Kiev were uh, rightly upset that uh, Yanukovych is giving up on the European perspective that was understandable. I think his position was much better understood in Donetsk and Luhansk than in Kiev or Lviv. And their, uh, I would say that their anger was actually too legitimate. I can understand them.
The problem was that these uh, demonstrations turned violent. They turned violent from both sides. They turned violent because Yanukovych was quite brutal. So he suppressed these demonstrators. Unfortunately, the demonstrators themselves were not, uh, not that peaceful. Now, I'm talking about 2014, about the first weeks of 2014, January, February. There was a lot of violence which was committed, actually, by anti-Yanukovych people. And these people actually understood that they had the backing. They had the backing of some Western powers, notably United States. Because for United States, it turned into a geopolitical game. Well, uh, well, let's have Ukraine. Let's have Ukraine. Uh, let's let's push Russian influence uh, back to to the east. So the result of the Maidan was the overthrow of the Yanukovych regime. A new regime started, and this regime was um, unambiguously Western oriented, uh, and it was actually American sponsored regime. That's uh, that, that's actually quite clear. Victoria Nuland actually made it clear that the, when she said uh, which names should be in the Kiev governments, and these were the names which were there. So, uh, so there was a new government which was uh, greeted. I mean, uh, the, in Europe, uh, in the United States, this was the government which was considered like the real government which which can which can bring Ukraine to Europe. But for Russia, that was like the end of any reasonable dialogue with Ukraine about Ukraine. They understood that they were losing Ukraine completely. That this government will do will will, will do will, will do all possible things which will go against Russia, and they started and uh, they turned violent. They turned violent. So they they sent their troops um, to, to to the Crimea. They they fomented fomented the conflict in the eastern Ukrainians in the eastern Ukraine. That was 2014. That was that was. Uh, not something which would be justifiable by international law or by, by any international uh, custom. It, it was it was it was a brutality, but we can understand actually why why, why Russia did it yeah. because the, what happened in Kiev was something which was actually which was some which was also the breach of many of many rules and customs, and we were in this situation since 2014 until 2021 which was actually a latent civil war in the East, occupation of, of Crimea. And um, then, I mean, the situation is again, again complicated because, you know, at certain point, I don't, we don't know what happened with Putin, but Putin started to push, uh, started to push on Ukraine. Whether the, this push was, to, whether he felt some justification, we are not sure what the justification was. But he amassed his troops around the Ukrainian borders. It's also true that the Ukrainian government actually mobilized its troops, its troops against Donbas. The Ukrainian government also thought that it would like to reunify Ukraine against with Crimea, Eastern, uh, Eastern Ukraine. And Putin said to the West in the, in the fall of 2021, well, let's talk about it. We need you to accept that Ukraine will never become the member of the, of the NATO. And a list of other requests, a list of other demands. Some of these demands were reasonable, some of them were not reasonable. In this respect, um, I think uh, what, what perhaps what we have missed somehow in the West was um, the opportunity to talk seriously with Russia about it. And we said about all, basically, with exception of two or three demands, which were secondary, that we are not able to, we, that we are not ready to talk about the Russia's security interest in Ukraine. That uh, it's Ukrainian choice whether Ukraine will become part of NATO or it will not become part of the NATO. And I think it's, it's a mistake. The NATO is not an organization to which any country should be entitled. I mean, when the NATO enlarges, it does this enlargement because it's a contribution to the security of its members. And if the members themselves were not unanimous that the enlargement with Ukraine would enhance their security. So in this respect, it made sense actually to speak with Russia about Ukraine, saying we understand this concern, but on the other hand, you keep control of an important part of Ukrainian territory, you do it unlawfully. So let's talk about it. Let's talk how to resolve it. Um, but the West didn't want to do it. Russia reacted in a way which is not which we cannot for which we cannot find an apology. Russia eventually actually started the invasion. As I said, this invasion is uh, is a huge mistake. It's a huge mistake because it, it brings a lot of suffering to everyone. 
But I still believe that this war could have been avoided. This war could have been avoided if uh, the West uh, was able, actually, to seriously talk with Russia in the fall of 2021. So from my perspective, we have actually two kinds of arrogance uh, involved in this conflict. There is a Russian arrogance on Ukraine, because I mean, well, the, the Russian discourse of Ukraine is difficult to accept because they don't consider Ukraine a nation. They deny it uh, any right to statehood. That's something which is not acceptable. On the other hand, we are we also face the Western arrogance, which actually is not able to recognize any security interest, strategic interest of Russia in its neighborhood, which does not mean that uh, I would say that we should recognize that uh, Russia is right in saying that the right that Ukrainians have no right to the state. That's not the issue. It's the fact that uh, we, uh, we should be able to recognize that Russia has a legitimate concern about military bases, military installations in the territory, which is immediate neighbor and which can be used um, to launch attack uh, against Russia. So in this respect, that's uh, what we missed because of our arrogance, which, do, as I said, does not deny that the, that the Russian responsibility for, 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 for the situation is enormous. You say we could have avoided the war. Sadly, this is history. The war is raging for more than two months now and more and more civilians get killed in Ukraine. Well, the question is, how can we come at the diplomatic solution right now? Is it possible to come at the diplomatic solution? And if it is possible, then what are the actors who actually have some force to uh, change the course of the negotiations we saw so far? Who are the actors who could effectively join the peace process so that the peace is achieved? If you say right now, it's important to stress right now, because right now is the end of April. And at this moment, I don't see that uh, the situation is mature for the diplomatic solution, unfortunately. Because to be ready for diplomatic solutions, you need to have a mutual interest, interest of both warring parties to end the hostilities and to start to talk. What we see on the ground is the opposite. We see Russia, which believes that it can militarily gain more territory, the territory it considers it needs. But at the same time, we also, we also see Ukraine, which believes that it can actually beat Russia, that it can actually win this conflict militarily, with, of course, with the American, with the, uh, with the American help. So we have, a str we have strong beliefs on both sides, that, the, that fighting is worthwhile. And if you have this situation, you do not have actually much opportunities for diplomacy. However, I believe that, or I believe definitely, there will be, there will be a point at which both parties will be exhausted enough, destroyed enough to come to the conclusion that diplomacy is needed. And at that point, uh, the the result will depend on the uh, will depend on the situation on the grounds. You know, it will depend on the territory which will be under the Russian control, and it will depend on the on on the control of Ukrainians. Unfortunately, I I believe that the borders of Ukraine will be different from what they were before the conflict, and um, well, it will be reasonable to ask actually from Russia to give security guarantees, to give some compensations. Uh, the question of neutrality will be discussed. The question of the neutrality of, of, of what will remain uh, of, of, of the Ukraine. But as I said, you know, we, right now we are actually too early. We, 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 it's, it's too early to, to say because, I mean, the whole diplomatic solution will be based on the military strategic situation on the ground. So. The, the more it will last, the, the, the worse it will be for everyone. But unfortunately, this simple logic does not, uh, does not count now because we are in the war and people are keen. They are keen on fighting. If people are keen on fighting, then is it possible that this war will not last months but years? We are now wondering in Poland, can this conflict, which is just behind our border, can it turn into another Syria? where fighting lasts for more a decade right now? 
or can we expect that a frozen conflict, yet another frozen conflict, appears in a post-Soviet uh, territory? What scenarios can we expect? Unfortunately, we cannot rule out what you just outlined. And that's, I mean, if, if you listen to the discourse of, the, of Boris Johnson, the British Prime Minister, he recently said that it can last until the end of next year which means like, I mean, almost two years, two years of fighting. So that's a, that's a very, uh, that's a very, that's a horrible, horrible alternative. And uh, what we now, what we, uh, and it seems to me, and that's very unfortunate, unfortunate, that there are actually forces in the West who are actually keen on this because they see it as an opportunity to keep Russia occupied, to keep Russia busy to weaken Russia. And perhaps if the Russia will be weak enough to bring about a regime change in Moscow. I mean, some, some people in the, in the United States and in the UK are clearly betting on that. So the idea is to supply as many weapons uh, as possible to Ukraine so that Russia gets exhausted by the war. And this exhaustion of Russia will definitely weaken it. And if everything goes according to the sort of these Anglo-American dreams, there may be a regime, a regime change. So it's a very wild, very dangerous bet. But uh, this bet may actually inform the policy of Washington and London um, on Ukraine. So unfortunately, there is, uh, there, there is part of the West which may be interested actually in long uh, Ukraine in long war on Ukraine or in a frozen conflict. It doesn't have to be that violent all the days. It can get frozen, unfortunately. But you know, the, the huge pace, the, the huge his price will be paid by Ukrainians. But a very huge price will also be paid by their neighbors. I mean, by Poland, Slovakia, Hungary, Czechia. So for us, you know, who are in the immediate neighborhood, this is not a good news. The, 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 the long fight of Ukrainians against Russia is, 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 not a, is, is not a good news. And the supply of the weapons is destructive to Ukraine, but it's also destructive to our economies and societies. Okay, I will now put uh, two questions in one uh, that we uh, we get in time well. Uh, I would ask you first of all, of course, um, some kind of evaluation what this war means for our region. As you said, it's uh, we are countries which are nearby. This is war which is in our neighborhood. It is uh, also um, uh, war and Russia's behavior which is completely changing in a way the um, security environment. So uh, how do you see, at least in the short term, in the few years, and uh, based on today's trends, of course, because we cannot say what will be in a few years, but based on trends which uh, we are seeing, uh, what kind of environment, uh, security and international environment, we will be living as a region now? And then uh, the second question connected with it is a bit if we are able to from this uh, war and from the all failed relationship with Russia, because this is the result of failed relations with Russia after the end of Cold War, that we, from one Cold War we came to the second Cold War. It's, it, it's, it's, it's really tragic. So are we able to get some historical le uh, lessons from it or we are forever uh, being in the cycle of, of blaming Russia and saying that we, we, we don't, we, we are all the time victims of, of, uh, of, of great power, named only Russia, of course. Is there some kind of uh, lesson for us from this happening? What, what, what is going on? Yeah, uh, well, you know, from strategic point of view, it, it really very much depends on what kind of lessons we draw from it, because you can have actually two quite opposite readings. So the first reading is that we underestimated Russia, uh, that we, we, we treated Russia too leniently in the past. So we must be much tougher with Russia, uh, we should actually have more united, more American presence in Europe. That's actually the reading which is now getting widespread. And uh, which, is, uh, which is the reading which actually uh, aims at having a new iron curtain between uh, Central Europe and, say, Eastern Europe. Maybe that this iron curtain will, will rise in the Eastern, in the Eastern Ukraine. Who, who knows? Uh, 
So that's one reading. The second reading is, and that's the reading which I would suggest, but it's actually much more difficult to accept. That, that, that would uh, imply that we acknowledged that not only that the Russia is brutal, hazardous, and are able to commit all possible crimes, that we also did some mistakes. And maybe that, uh, the, that we should, uh, that we got actually, um, that we got too dependent, strategically dependent on the United States and on their geopolitical game. So that second reading would suggest that us as Europeans or us as Central Europeans are able to create a real strategic autonomy. Because we, we obviously see that the initial positions of Paris, uh, from Paris and Berlin have been and still are different from the position of London and Washington. So the question is whether we are actually able to create a European security architecture, which would be, which would be actually, which, which would give us some strategic autonomy. Right now, it's almost impossible to think about any European security strat architecture with Russia. Even though in January, that was still one of the options which even President Macron acknowledged as a possibility. So that's not for today. But um, once the fighting uh, ceases and once, uh, once sort of things calm down, that will be uh, another thing on the agenda. How this European security architecture or even Atlantic security architecture is able to involve Russia or deal with Russia. But at this moment, it's not possible because that requires diplomacy. And all the European countries are giving up on diplomacy. So they are actually sending back Russian diplomats. So if you look at the diplomatic relations between European countries and Russia, it's actually converging to zero. In our region, our region is part of this, of course. So we uh, people in our region are probably more scared than people in Western Europe because they are exposed to these dangers, especially in, the, in Poland and in the Baltic countries, because they feel the immediate effects. Our societies are destabilized by the massive migration. Um, I think that the initial reaction of our countries was admirable, was actually exemplary. Especially the Polish reaction was exemplary because as far as um, I understand, there are almost 3 million refugees uh, in Poland, 5 million refugees in total, 3 million in Poland, which is really a lot. It's actually much more than what the Western countries experienced in 2014-15. And Poland is not complaining about this. It's not asking for redistribution around Europe. Poland is actually doing it, it, its job in a way which, um, for, for which everyone should have. Everyone should have a deep respect. But in the long run, it cannot work. You know, I mean, our societies and economies are not actually strong enough to absorb all of this. So that's uh, that's really a problem uh, an issue we need to address. And then, of course, the economic disaster. I mean, Russian, Russian economy and European economies are intertwined. So it's, I mean, in energy, it's, it's obvious. So right now we cannot actually cut these ties, even though some people, some people are calling for it. I, I consider these calls irresponsible, but uh, today we live in the period of irresponsibility. So the economic damage will be huge. There will be a direct economic damage to our economies and then indirect economic damage because of the crisis in Germany. Because, I mean, uh, the German economy is heavily dependent on, um, on, on Russia. And the German economic crisis means the economic crisis for our economies as well. So the future of our region or the next months or the next years are actually very, very dark. And I don't see actually that our governments are taking this challenge seriously. Uh, I, uh, I hear the Czech governments calling for, for cutting off uh, the supplies of uh, the Russian energy supplies, even though they are quite aware that we do not have any alternative. So this economic reality is as if we could deny economic reality, but this economic reality will come, uh, will, will come back to us. With, with vengeance, with vengeance. So I expect actually a lot of social instability because people will be desperate. People will be desperate. Well, it would be good to finish on a more positive note, but unfortunately, what you say is very relevant. Even now, I can say in Poland, we are starting to see a debate what next for our country. Now, when Russian gas was cut by Gazprom from Poland, we are not receiving it anymore, effective from, today, from 27th April. 
So uh, we also start to realize that the three million Ukraine, three million of Ukrainian refugees that we welcomed with open hearts will not all find jobs in Poland. And uh, definitely we had social problems we hadn't resolved before more challenges came to us. So I feel as our time is getting, getting over, I would like just to thank you for your remarks. Thank you for your comments. Thank you for your expertise. And uh, I hope we will be able to meet one day in cross-border talks to discuss a post-war peaceful Ukraine with perspectives for rebuilding, perspectives for renovation. Thank you very much. And uh, let us hope that we will meet in better time.